Our meditation today will follow three steps. In the first step, we will separate the subject, that is our self, from various objects. And thereby we'll discover that we are taking our stand as witnessing awareness. In the second step, we shall explore the nature of the subject, our self or awareness. And in the third and final step, we will return to all the objects that have been set aside in order to see what they truly consist of. So part one. Start with the presupposition, the deeply held belief that I am this and that I am not that. The I am not that refers to not me while the I am this refers to I or me or myself. Initially, it seems as if I am this refers straight away to the body mind complex or to the body or to the mind we will need to investigate that assumption shortly consider first for a moment the world We want to submit our understanding of the world to direct experience, that is to what we actually experience or know. The question quickly arises, do we actually know or have knowledge of the world through direct experience? No, the only knowledge that we have is knowledge of perception, sights, sounds, tastes, touches, and smells. If you consider the question deeply enough, namely, where do I find the world? The answer is twofold. In the first place, you don't find the world as a thing in experience. In the second place, you only ever find the world rising when it does in the form of a thought. But for the time being, we're not actually interested in thought. We're interested in whatever access we have to the world whatever direct access we have to the world. So set aside thought 
the time being and draw your attention to sense perceptions. Specifically for our purposes now to sound. Consider the question, when there is hearing this voice right now, do you find in your direct experience any evidence for the existence of an independently existing object, the voice? Or do you only discover the sound? That is, if you stick only with your direct experience of hearing, do you immediately find an object called the voice? Or do you only discover, quite naturally, sound? Let the understanding sink in. You only discover the sound. The inquiry continues. Indeed, do you only ever discover some object called the sound? Or do you simply find loudness or softness, resonance or lack thereof, or in any case, some quality or other? Again, do you actually discover some kind of entity or packet sound? Or do you discover, for instance, vibration? Vibratoriness, timber or tone or melody, etc. Perhaps it is surprising that you never actually find the sound. You only ever are aware of some sensible quality or other. Keep going. In fact, do you only ever discover some sensible quality, resonance, etc.? Or does it actually require hearing in order for there to be any sense quality, whatever? Once more, do you ever find an independently existing sense quality, one that doesn't actually involve the process of hearing, or isn't it fair to say that this sense quality is only evident in the presence of hearing just now? In fact, try to experience any audible sense quality while turning off hearing. For if this sense quality exists in its own right, then it should not require 
the process of hearing. And yet, when we try to stop hearing, we cannot find the sense quality. Or when the sense quality is rising or appearing, and we try to will ourselves not to hear, we can't but spontaneously hear. Let this understanding sink in. Let it be clear that in essence, there's only hearing or just hearing or hearing arising or hearing vibrating. Experience or taste this understanding right now. When there is hearing, there is hearing. And when there is not hearing, like now, there is not hearing or silence. That is to say, experience or taste the intimacy of hearing. And likewise, the supreme intimacy of silence. Consider the question, to what is this inquiry pointing? Notice that it's taking us backward from gross objects to more and more subtle perceiving. Now examine the question, to whom or to what is hearing appearing? Do you find any evidence for an entity called a separate hearer? If you don't appeal to thought or memory? Or is it not clear that what you actually discover is openness? Welcoming? Availability? In a word, witnessing? Take note, witnessing awareness, yourself, is that which is illuminating the process of hearing. It is that to which the process of hearing is appearing. And therefore, hearing could not appear at all were it not for the background of witnessing awareness, this non-entity openness, this relaxed welcomingness. In other words, this experience, hearing, is dependent on the existence of you, the subject, witnessing awareness.
Notice already how far we have come, or really we haven't gone anywhere. We can begin to understand how I, myself, witnessing awareness, am that on whose behalf all processes of perceiving are unfolding. I find no independently existing world, yet I do find hearing when there's hearing, seeing when there is seeing, tasting, touching, and smelling. In fact, I am that which illuminates tasting in order for tasting to appear in the first place. And I am also that which illuminates seeing in order for seeing to arise. And I am that which illuminates the process of hearing when hearing appears, so that hearing can appear. In the initial conception, I am not this referred to the world. It is clear now that I am indeed not the world. And it's even clear that I am not the senses. Seeing, touching, tasting, smelling and hearing. For these are my experiences, or these are the objects loosely understood, that appear to me. Thus I remain as the background to whom or to which these appearances arise. We move on to consider the body. For the I am the body idea tends to be a very sticky one. Begin the investigation of the body by calling forth an image of the body. Perhaps you imagine the body as seen in a mirror. Perhaps a thought arises, this is my body, or I am beautiful or handsome, or I am ugly, or I am aging, or I am looking fresh, and so on. Our investigation, however, is not interested first and foremost, or really at all, in images of the body, but rather in the experience of the body itself. An analogy might bring this out. Suppose it were the case that you saw a portrait painting of an especially interesting figure, one to whom you were drawn. You found out that this figure is still living and you want to know this figure in and out, up and down. So would you keep looking at the painting however wonderfully it was rendered? 
or would you try to go and find the sitter, the figure represented by the painting? Naturally, if you wanted to know the sitter, you would go directly to that one. Likewise, why on earth, if we wanted to understand the body in our experience, would we continue to go to images or pictures of the body? We're not interested in what the body may look like from the point of view of a second person imagined or otherwise. That is, we're not interested in what the body may look like from the point of view of a John or a Jane who are looking in this direction. Rather, we're interested in what the experience of the body actually is. Therefore, we cannot legitimately avail ourselves of any image of the body if we wish to understand the body in and through direct experience. The same line of inquiry applies to memories. So let any memories of the body come to mind. A memory of a time when you were five or 10 or 15 or whatever. In fact, it could be a memory from earlier today, a memory of the body from earlier today. Just as an image of the body is providing a mental representation of the body and therefore does not grant us access to the experience of the body itself, so a memory of the body is also a mental representation of the body and therefore cannot provide us with direct access to the body itself. Consequently, we let go of memories as well. What then are we left with? Quite simply, we draw our attention now to the body or we turn our attention within the body. Notice what we don't discover. We do not discover a silhouette. For this undulation or effervescence is not a definite shape or size. What is it actually? It's actually a sensation. Or a series or network of pulsating sensations. Or a vibrant moment by moment changing field of energy. Consider the question, are you the same as a sensation or are you that which is aware of sensation? of this one, of that one, 
of any sensation. Notice what it's like to sink back in the realization that you are that which is aware of any sensation whatsoever. But if you are aware of any sensation whatsoever, then it immediately follows that you are not this sensation, or indeed that sensation, or indeed that other sensation. But if the immediate or direct experience of the body is the experience of sensation, and if you are not any sensation, then it follows that you are not the body. Let this understanding sink in. You are the luminous openness to which sensations appear. It's often believed this is because I am the mind. Is that actually the case? A common conception of the mind is that it's a container in which thoughts appear. Therefore, consider, first of all, the question, can you actually discern a container in your direct experience? If you allow a thought like one to come to mind, do you discover that there is some kind of container in which one is occurring. There may be a thought for a time that says, yes, it is the head. But we're not asking about more concepts or more thoughts. We're asking rather about whether you can directly apprehend such a container in which one is appearing. Once again, then, do you find a container in which one is appearing? You do not. For the time being, we can say that you simply discover that there is space nebulous space or empty space in which one is appearing. Reintroduce the thought one a few more times in order to let this understanding become clear. The understanding being that one is rising in this nebulous or empty space, not in some kind of container labeled mind. Since we can find no entity called mind, one that is separate from the thought like one, we are forced on pain of reasoning 
to conclude that mind is identical with thought or with the process of thinking, at which point then we can ask, am I awareness identical with thought? Or again, am I that which is aware of the rising and falling of one? Explore this on your own. Allow one to arise and see what it's like. Notice that every time one arises, you remain as the aware presence to which it appears. And notice that as one subsides, you likewise remain the aware presence, witnessing it all the while. we have hit upon our first surprise. We're not surprised by the realization that we are not the world, but we may well be surprised by the understanding that we are not the body-mind, that we are neither the body nor the mind. Instead, we are at this level of understanding, witnessing awareness, that to whom or to which perceiving, sensing, and thinking are all appearing. And therefore, our fate, if you will, is not that of sensing, which rises and falls as sensation, of perceiving, which rises and falls as hearing and seeing and so forth. Nor is our fate that of the mind, which is nothing but thinking intermittently rising and falling. So part two. One question to consider, indeed, perhaps the most important one, pertains to the nature of witnessing awareness. It is, am I myself witnessing awareness, limited or unlimited? Suppose that I am limited, then I can only be limited by anything related to the senses or the mind.
consider the following questions. Turn immediately toward witnessing awareness, toward yourself, and see, are you visible? Are you yourself right now, right here, visible? I don't mean, could a memory arise? Set that off to the side. I don't mean, could some other thought arise? A discursive thought? Let that one go. I mean, quite innocently and literally, am I myself visible? And am I myself audible? Is there anything about my sense of myself, my being aware that is audible? Can I be tasted? And if so, what flavor am I? Can I be touched? And if so, am I warm or cold? Or what sort of texture do I have? I try to touch myself right now, what happens? I don't mean if a hand moves and touches another hand. We have already discovered that I am not the body, so we need to set that off to the side. I mean that if I were to try to touch myself, what would I discover? And if I were to try to, to smell myself, what might I find? We are coming to understand what the Upanishads means when it says that I am the unseen seer. I'm also inaudible, intangible, and so forth. I can't, so to say, use a sense organ or sense instrument to gain access to myself, to my nature. In fact, I'm coming and understand very directly and immediately that I am and can be no object, can be no objective experience. Therefore, in this inquiry at this point, sense activity is, as it were, null and void. Those limiting factors simply do not apply to me. So I turn to mental categories. As I remain myself, I can ask, am I conceivable? conceptualizable, thinkable. I do not mean can a thought arise. A thought 
is an objective experience. I know that I am not a thought, for I am that to whom a thought appears. I want to know myself as myself, and therefore I ask, am I conceptualizable? Or which sort of name can I give myself? Could it be true that I am indeed beyond concepts and beyond names? But then am I somehow feelable? That is, am I anger or like anger? Am I sadness or like sadness? Am I like a momentary flowering of joy? Am I despair, or like despair? Am I fear or like fear or dread, or nervousness? When I remain as myself, I can't get a purchase in a way on any of those questions. All of these questions seem inapplicable, nonsensical, in a certain sense, rather absurd. I am neither, of course, a thought or a feeling. But if I am upstream, as it were, from the senses and from the mind, then what could limit me? The obvious candidates are space, time, and causality. Consider space. In my direct experience right now of myself, can I find a here, a there, and an over there? There may be a tendency to superimpose mind-concocted points in me, in which case let all those thoughts go and ask the question again. In my direct experience, can I find a here, a there, and an over there? For the moment, it might feel as if I am vast, but that teaching is only meant to be a corrective to the feeling or deeply held belief that I am small and enclosed. Is it really true that I am vast? Do I have a size or a shape? Do I have any borders or boundaries in my actual experience? Can I really say that I am vast or that I am not vast? Would it not be truer to say that I am none of these? Because I cannot locate myself in space. And therefore, 
let me be open to the possibility that I am beyond the space concept. And if that is true, that I am in a sense nowhere and everywhere. I am at once the center and the circumference. Let me consider then, am I in time? Well, in my actual experience, can I find a now and a later? Or a before as well as an after? Do I find any events or experiences that could be such as to be said to pass through time? When I look innocently and closely at the matter, I do not find a now as opposed to a then, a before as opposed to an after. I find nothing of the sort. I only find presence or nowness. Just as with regard to space, I only discovered here-ness or spacelessness. Consider finally the question of causality. Obviously, it's impossible to even conceive of causality in the absence of space-time. But let's begin nonetheless. As I turn toward myself or abide in myself, do I discover any parts? Can I see this part set apart from that part? For I need there to be at least two things in me in order for there to be even the possibility of ordinarily understood causality. And if I cannot discern, as is true, any parts, and therefore if I am indivisible or partless, then how could it possibly be the case that I am subject to causality? What is causing what? If I am beyond space, beyond time, beyond form, beyond causality, then in the very least, at this point in this inquiry, let me be innocently open to the possibility that I am unlimited. That I am aware, quiet presence. So now, part three. 
up to this point, we have been separating the subject, ourself, from all objects in order to take our stand as witnessing awareness. From here, we begin to explore whether our self awareness is limited or unlimited. And we are open to the possibility that our self is unlimited. But then what about those objects that have been, in a manner of speaking, left behind? Return to but one objective experience, that of hearing. And consider, if only briefly, the following line of argument. Whatever it is that I, awareness, touch, so to say, turns into me or my stuff. Whatever it is that I touch by virtue of being aware of it gets transformed into me. It's as if I have the Midas touch. Whatever it is that I touch turns to gold, regardless of its preconceived content. So come back to hearing. Hearing is rising right now. And consider the following, open to the following. I awareness am touching intimately hearing right now. Since I am touching hearing right now, hearing must be made of awareness stuff, that is, of me. Therefore, hearing is nothing but the stuff or substance of awareness. To explore this further, consider the question. In the experience of hearing, do you find two experiences? One, hearing, and two, awareness of hearing? Or on the contrary, do you find simply one unbroken, seamless experience? As you listen just now, look for two experiences, hearing and awareness, and see whether you can discover some kind of border or boundary that separates hearing from awareness. No matter how hard you try, no matter how assiduous your efforts, you do not, nor can you, discover a line that separates hearing from awareness. But that can mean only one of two things, either that hearing has colonized awareness or that awareness has colonized hearing. So which is it? If hearing had colonized awareness, then hearing would be able to exist independently of awareness. But we have already found that that can't be true. Hearing cannot exist independently 
of awareness. Therefore, since the experience is one, such that whenever there is hearing, there is awareness, it must be the case that awareness has and is colonizing the process of hearing. This means that hearing right now is totally drenched, not just dipped, but drenched in awareness. So pervaded and permeated by awareness as to be nothing but awareness. It could be said that hearing is one way in which awareness is awaring. Awareness presently is awaring right now in and as hearing. Hearing is lit up through and through by awareness touched in all parts by nothing but awareness. Hearing, in other words, is the very vibration of awareness. The play right now of awareness. Hearing is how awareness is experiencing, just like this. If in an oft used analogy, hearing is like a wave, then awareness is like the water. The wave is a temporary shape of the water, temporary shape that the water assumes without losing its essential nature as awareness. This is as much as to say that awareness is frolicking as hearing right now. Frolicking as this immersive experiencing. And awareness ourself remains the same when hearing subsides, awareness remains presence. Presence touches hearing and presence remains itself. 